TEPCO staff also investigated radioactive fallout from another of the Fukushima Daiichi plant's reactors. They say the substances probably leaked directly from the containment vessel. Workers repeatedly vented the containment vessel on reactor 3 to release water vapor and reduce pressure. Officials say the release of radioactive materials into the environment was probably not caused by the venting. They suspect the heat of fuel caused the containment vessel to lose air tightness. TEPCO staff are continuing their investigation because some experts disagree with the report. Engineers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant are facing yet another challenge in the troubled work to decommission the facility. They installed a steel barrier in an effort to prevent contaminated groundwater from reaching the sea. But now they say it led to an increase in the amount of contaminated water. In October, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, had the steel piling wall built along the plant's embankment. The initial plan was to pump up groundwater, remove radioactive materials, and then release most of the water into the sea. On Friday, TEPCO officials told nuclear regulators that some of the groundwater is too salty to be processed by the decontamination equipment at the facility. They also said they discovered the need to pump up more water than initially planned. The officials say because the water cannot be released into the sea, Workers are putting it into reactor buildings at a rate of about 400,000 liters per day. The utility has been making efforts to reduce the flow of water into buildings where it gets contaminated. Those efforts include pumping up groundwater from wells inside the compound, which did manage to reduce the amount going into buildings. However, the effect of such efforts has been canceled out by the decision to divert untreated water from the embankment into the buildings. TEPCO says it plans to pump up more groundwater upstream so that less reaches the embankment. It says it will also try to process a greater amount of salty water by carefully monitoring its quality. The operator of Japan's only online nuclear power plant has submitted plans for anti-terrorism measures to regulators. Well, since 2013, utilities have been required to establish a backup control room to use if the main facility is destroyed. The operator of the Sendai plant in southwestern Japan submitted its plans to the Nuclear Regulation Authority on Thursday. Utilities must set up a second control room and an additional cooling facility at least 100 meters from a reactor. Kyushu Electric Power says it plans to build its backup control room inside its cooling facility. The regulator has asked the company to complete construction by May 2020, but utility officials have not announced when the project will be finished. A new earthquake study by the Japanese government has important safety information for anyone living in a high-rise. It found that swaying in high-rise buildings can be affected by the length of vibrations in an earthquake. The study released on Thursday already has people talking. NHK World's Tomoko Kurabayashi has the details. So scary. There's no way to escape. People in Osaka react to a video. A simulation of what happens inside a high rise during an earthquake. Furniture toss around, intense swaying. A new study from the Japanese government says the swaying can be a lot worse. It all depends on where the earthquake hits. The study looked at the Nankai trough of the Pacific coast from Tokai to Kyushu in western Japan. It found swaying in buildings will be much worse if a quake struck this area. And experts say the Nankai trough is overdue for a big jolt. If a big earthquake hit this area, it could produce what scientists call long period ground motion. That means ground movement during an earthquake that causes vibrations that last a long time. 
Earthquakes causing short, quick ground vibrations do not generate intense swaying, but long period ground motion causes intense swaying in high rise buildings. And inside, there is lots of damage. The March 2011 powerful quake that hit northern Japan did this in Tokyo. This is a video from a restaurant in a high rise. Skyscraper in Tokyo swayed slowly. The mega quake generated long period ground motion. The swaying does not die down, even in areas far from the epicenter. And it's a huge concern for this disaster relief expert. There can be more than a thousand people in each skyscraper. Several million people could be affected by the swaying. If they're hit by heavy objects, it could kill them. Precautions must be taken. And some cities are already taking those precautions. So, Japan's tourist building in Osaka was built equipped with the latest technology. It limits swaying during an earthquake. The walls of the middle floors have steel plates. They are designed to absorb energy from tremors and minimize the effects. News of the study has already reached people in the business of selling homes in high rises. We will take the results into consideration. We would like to think about them for the work we do. The March 2011 earthquake had a magnitude of 9.0. Experts say another mega earthquake could hit at any time. But with continued study and action being taken, the country can be as prepared as possible for the inevitable. Tomoko Karabayas, NHK World. Residents of a disaster hit town in northeastern Japan are celebrating the return of something many take for granted the return of routine life. They lost loved ones, homes, even medical services in the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Well, four and a half years on, they are hailing the reopening of their local hospital. The new Minami Sanriku Hospital is built on higher ground than its predecessor. The modern three-story building consists of 10 departments, with 90 beds for inpatients, as well as a nursing care facility. It's very convenient to have a hospital in town and a doctor who can see me immediately when I'm not well. A tsunami more than 15 meters high flooded the old hospital up to the fourth floor. 74 patients and staff were killed. And it also left the area with no medical services. Hi. Okay. In the medical aid station set up immediately after the disaster, Dr. Masafumi Nishizawa organized support teams from around the country and worked hard to provide care to all local residents. I've heard the water supply is running low. Still, we'll continue to take care examining patients, mainly to prevent the spread of disease. In some cases, he had to send doctors to remote areas. Despite support from home and abroad, the hospital could not be rebuilt right away. Some patients had to check into a facility in a neighboring city 35 kilometers away. Traveling so far to look after the patients has been really tough on both our staff and the patients' families. Japan's self-defense forces helped with the task of transporting 22 patients from the distant facility to the new hospital. It took an hour for each trip between the two locations. At the new building, Nishizawa was ready for their arrival. The patients need to be transported with extreme care. And four hours after the start of the operation, everyone had been safely transferred. I'm really grateful for your help in completing the transfers so smoothly. 
Thank you very much. Now the hospital has been rebuilt, I feel we are finally back at the start line. The physical side is ready, so next we hope to provide the soft side, good medical services the community can trust. But there are still obstacles to overcome, as there are only three full-time doctors at the hospital. It really needs another four, so it has been relying temporarily on part-time doctors from several universities. We asked an expert who has been working in the worst affected areas. We need to build a permanent system for stationing doctors in these areas. Under a new government policy, medical schools in Japan can now accept more students. So one solution would be to encourage schools to increase the number of doctors. If the disaster-hit region is to get properly back on its feet, healthcare services are indispensable to a full recovery. That's why a thorough and robust medical system needs to be put in place as soon as possible. Fish auctions are big business in Japan with the most flavorful specimens making their way to top-tier sushi restaurants. At one particular auction, however, the fish are sold to survive, NHK World's Maria Imura reports. Overseas bloggers get out of their cars to take in the preview of auction lots. Nishiki Koi Carp. Some carp sell for several thousand dollars. Their colorful patterns have earned them the nickname Swimming Jewels. Buyers from abroad account for 95% of this wholesaler's annual sales. He says, the scene the shift in nationalities. I used to have a lot of European buyers. This graph shows exposed sales of Nishikigoi and other aquarium fish. Over the past 10 years, the biggest increase has come from Hong Kong, the doorway to China. That market has started to shrink though. Danny I from Hong Kong exposed to China. He buys expensive carp at this auction every year. But he says wealthy Chinese aren't spending like they used to. Now Mississippi market in yeah, China, in China. now a little bit go down. It's gonna be now not so good. On the other hand, Sugiado Buriono is eager to buy. He's a broker from Indonesia. Indonesia Nisikigoi market, uh, I think, uh, now growing. Buriono's country has been enjoying economic growth. Sales are up there and in other parts of Southeast Asia. Indonesia is a huge market with the fourth largest population in the world. Many well-to-do young people are moving from Jakarta to the suburbs where they have room to build big houses with gardens. Nishiki Koi add to the atmosphere. Some developer uh, design, give the design or offer to everybody who want to buy this house like this and then a uh, garden or pond, yeah. pond, koi pond there. Buriono was keeping an eye on the large carp going up for auction, but he wasn't the only one. Maybe this is more than one million, maybe. Bidders sent the price up and up, but Budiono got what he came for, with a one million yen bid, more than eight thousand dollars. He went on to pay an even higher price for another car. Auction is good. I think reasonable price. Yeah. I, the leader from Hong Kong, was shopping in the $2,500 range. His strategy was to lease sell to younger customers. He bought 35 car, more than any other buyer. I can get the, my coin in my budget. And the China economy going bad, the coin market no problem.
all together, the auction set records for volume and money following the current of economies in Asia. As more foreign travelers come to Tokyo, a unique tour guide is starting to offer sightseeing information. The guide may look human, but it's an android resembling a young woman. She went into operation on Thursday at a shopping mall in Tokyo Bay. When a visitor selects a sightseeing spot on a touch screen, the robot can introduce the site in English, Chinese, or Japanese. Meiji Jingu and Shibuya Ward enshrines the souls of Emperor Meiji and Empress Shoken. The officials say this is the world's first Android guide to work around the clock at an information desk. Android uh, person, I think it's very nice and it's very unique. We don't have it in Indonesia yet. And then I think it's very useful to give information. The Android was developed by Japanese electronics firm Toshiba. A company official says the robot can offer a consistently high level of service. We hope the Android will welcome foreign visitors to Japan and will also serve to demonstrate our high-level technology. The official says the firm plans to upgrade the robot in two years with artificial intelligence technology so it can reply to spoken questions.